Welcome to the Australian Property Investment Podcast, where we tackle the big questions in property investing. Our guests are industry experts, and we're fortunate to pick their brains on the challenges that investors often encounter when growing their property portfolio. Welcome to the Australian Property Investment Podcast. Let's start investing. G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Christie David, and I run a mortgage broking business called Atelier Wealth, where we specialize in helping property investors start out and scale up their property portfolios. And as part of that journey, what we say is central to that is making confident property decisions. And confidence is very much intangible, but it's central to making sure that we get made, people making maybe less decisions, but more confident decisions, if that makes sense sense as well. And as part of that journey, the reason why we set up this podcast is we're getting commonly asked questions from clients that maybe wasn't in my wheelhouse, or maybe it was an expert that could come in and answer those questions as well, because naturally I can't give some advice. And this podcast isn't about giving advice either. So if you do need advice, please know that this is general in nature. So you need to seek out a professional. But having said that, our guest today has years of experience, a mountain of knowledge, and overall a fantastic smile, and is such a great warming person as well. Julie Crockett, welcome back. And I say welcome back with a smile on my face because it's wonderful to see you as well. Oh, thank you, Aaron. It's wonderful to be here. Yeah. Julie, you have, and I say this with all due respect, you've been around property for some time, right? So you've seen cycles, you've seen buyers come and go, you've seen people that have gone on to achieve some great things. So before we do kick off and go down that pathway, as we always introduce us, our guests, a bit about yourself personally, professionally and property-wise as well, since last time. Since last time, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, I have been around for a while and I, I love property, what can I say? Yeah. I started in 2002 personally investing in property and I I started that journey because I received a superannuation statement in the mail. I was working as a teacher in those days. And yes, there was no mail back then. And, <laughs> and you were called uh, we... uh, Miss Crockett then as opposed to Julie? Or was that your... No, no, I was still, yeah, no, no, no. I was still yeah. the married per version of it. And basically, yeah. I was absolutely stunned when I got this statement and I thought, wow, what am I going to do? I have to do something otherwise I'm going to end up a really poor old teacher who will never be able to stop teaching. Mm. And uh, I then started my very first um, property investment and, yeah, got really addicted to it and then couldn't stop. <laughs> well done. Well yeah, done. and, um, you know, the, my life has changed dramatically since then because obviously I have um, not only got a big portfolio but, yeah, changed my business as well changed your business as well absolutely and i guess what that knock-on effect has done like that that standard you set for yourself i know your daughter you've then kind of lifted you know tied the the ships around you have risen as well so your yep. decision has now changed your daughter's life the people around her our connection has changed some of our clients lives for example and so everyone that you yep. come into contact kind of from 2002 just think about that ripple effect that's happened that's amazing off the back of that single decision and that's what property yes can yeah. do. Property is such a game changer from a personal wealth and intergenerational wealth. And then your net, they say your network is your net wealth, for example, that yeah. then starts to change as well, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, for the parents who are listening to this podcast, the one single thing that you can do that is the most powerful thing you can do to make sure that you have intergenerational wealth is to actually help your, not help your kids, show them how to do it, show them how to invest and have the faith that they will continue on to do, you know, what you have shown them to do. And there's no more powerful thing than watching your child create their own wealth mm. with very little help from me, but guidance. So guidance is critical to then know that whatever happens in her life, she'll be absolutely fine mm. financially. Julie, you have nailed it. I think you must have a you must have a listening device in our office because I think in the last <laughs> week, I'll, I'll elaborate this on in a second. So there's a question in here. In the last <laughs> week, we've probably dealt with a few parents, and we say parents are often the ones that bring a deal unstuck. And I'm yep. surprised at how often I say this again. We love our clients. I say this with due respect, right? The amount of times the parents get involved and it's like, nah, overpaying, and we're not going to do this, and suddenly it's like the entire dynamic has shifted. I was like. How can we get parents to come become the enabler? Property buying from the last five years to now has shifted dramatically. 
property buying from the last 12 months to now shifted dramatically. Yeah. There is a different style of negotiation, there's a different style of lending, there's a different style in how things are done. And quite often we're seeing parents come in and dismantle a deal or erode a child's confidence. And there are some examples where it may be a gift from the bank of mum and dad. And again, that's a certain level of respect that has to go out there as well. I get this family and money, but there are ways to make sure that this is done above board and make sure this is done correctly as well to enable as opposed to disable a deal as well. Yeah. I think one one of the big issues you've raised there is that a lot of parents potentially are not investors themselves. And if they haven't been in the market, they don't really understand how the market's performing. And so mm. therefore you've got this the value judgments coming over the top of decision making. And mm. so what we see then is parents trying to do their best in Correct. inverted commas to put their kids on the straight and narrow as far as property is concerned, but they're bringing decades ago knowledge of when they may have bought a property. And heaven only knows, it's a very different, I, I, I call it a game, but it's a very different game these days to, right. to when they may have bought their own property. So yeah, and I understand what you're saying there that there's multiple layers of emotion wrapped up in that and there's mm. also multiple layers of responsibility that parents see as their responsibility when in actual fact they should be really trusting that this will work well and mm. have their hands off it. Hands I off. Agree. I agree. There's a protective well, nature inside being a parent and I can kind of say from my own perspective as a newer, younger parent, I was like, how do I, and again, it's about setting up. And the analogy I use for a lot of parents is you got to put the gas mask on yourself. They're trying to help their kids. I'm like, help yourself, raise your standards, have a great portfolio. That's going to give you more resources and help your kids as opposed to I'm going to buy this property for my kids. It's like, but you're not growing your own personal wealth. You're putting the gas mask on your kid, which is often what we do as parents. We kind of sacrifice ourselves as opposed mm -hmm. to, but hang on, if I kind of grow, I've got more resources to help my family. They see what I'm doing. Therefore, they're uplifted to go, well, hang on, dad's made or mum's made that decision and we're, we're pro-property as opposed to what? we're scared by the property market. It's never a good time to buy. We're going to be generational renters, for example, and I think those lessons are so powerful to pass down by seeing as opposed to telling as well. That's a perfect segue really into rent vesting as well. Yeah. You know, there's lots of ways to get into property. Yeah. And again, if we're coming from a knowledge base of decades ago when we may have bought our first property or yeah. whatever, you know, it, it this entrenched thinking that somehow, somewhere we have to own our own home. Mm. And yes, I agree. There's a certain level of security and stability in doing that. But in year 2023... Is there another way of actually achieving that goal? Yep. Do we have to have the million dollar mortgage? Do we have to, in order to achieve our own home and put ourselves, our marriage, every relationship we have under so much pressure that we just can't keep up? And that in itself renders you know, a whole range of then huge issues that can occur from that. And I just sort of don't want to go down that track. But what I'm saying is, you know, reinvesting could be a really viable option. Yeah. And that is, you know, children renting where they want to live and buying in more affordable cities. You know, at the moment, we've got some great buys. Yeah. Please don't. And for, the, for you know, top tip here, please don't listen to the media. They're causing a whole lot of people to become so hyper anxious. Yeah. And incredibly feel the feeling of hopelessness. Among yes. first-time buyers is palpable. And if we can't offer them a solution, then what are we doing? Really, what are we doing? Okay. The solution, one of the solutions would be, I really believe, is you know, looking at those affordable markets and, and buying an investment that is affordable, that has, you know, as as you know well, Aaron, all of the deductions and, mm. and you know, the tax benefits, all the cost effectiveness to do that then enables, you know, your child to be able, your whoever, to be able to then, you know, get into property in a more manageable and sustainable way and then to build their portfolio. And I've had clients do that from as far back as 10 years ago. I've yeah. had clients who've come through and have rent vested and got to a point where they went, oh, look at this. We've got enough equity to, you know, buy a block of land, build our own home. Mm. And that's exactly what they've done. So, there's more than one way to skin that property cat. I love it. I love it. Well said. I mean, when you look at the stats, and I watched a great video the other day talking about you know buying 
1983 versus buying in 2023, for example, and the, how much it's shifted, the, the debt to income ratio to buy a house, the time to save for a deposit, for example, that, that's changed completely. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so I guess there's this huge amount of empathy that we've got for home buyers, but then there's a lack of sympathy where I'm like, other people are just getting on with it and getting into the market and rent investing yeah, think- is one potential way. It's, so I think you can kind of be in one camp, which is waiting for prices to fall, waiting for the right time to buy, waiting for the right property to come along, waiting, 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 other po- as opposed to someone that's going well you know what waiting didn't really work for me i bought that property it's yep it's not where i want to live it's an investment property i missed out on some first time owner grants which very few of our clients actually even claim as well yeah because the first statistically the first home the average age for a sydney first home buyer is 40 and i was nearly that when i bought oh, our family yeah. home and i was like that Why? makes sense that's kind of when i've got the big deposit it's when i want to got the serviceability from an income perspective it's where i know i want to live long term and generally family like the stars align that's, that's when you put down roots but having bought properties before that got us to that stage in life because there's no way we could have just fast tracked that type of deposit on those incomes in our 30s as well yeah beautiful so as a first time investor so i want to talk about the first time investor so you got two first time investors one is the rent investor and which we've just spoken about the other is someone like our situation which is i've got my home now i've got equity now i'm going to go and buy my first investment property as well so you've got the means and the equity to do it how are those two investors so they're still first-time investors but very different conversations going to have between a rent investor and a homeowner using equity for example can you take us through how you kind of handle those conversations julie yeah, absolutely. So with rent vesting, it's very much based on the numbers the other way as well. We yeah. look at numbers, we make sure that what they're looking to purchase is going to make sense because a lot of people have been caught up in the past with buying properties that are quite negatively geared. And in in those wonderful, warm, fuzzy days when we had such low interest rates, it's not too hard to carry, you know, one or two or however many negatively geared prop- properties if you had a good a good income or double Correct. income. Right. Of course, times have changed. And even back then when it was really great times interest rate wise, I was still advising my clients and I still would today, no matter what the scenario with interest rates, always look for something that is going to help you hold it. Mm. Because we know that Buying property is a buy and hold proposition. You know, it will do okay in, you know, the first five years, perhaps. By the year 10, yeah, it should be, you should see some reasonable sorts of gains. By year 20, you'll be smashing it. Now, yeah. most people do not have the wherewithal to hold out for 20 years. They go, oh, 20 years of my life. I think, but that's the reality of property investing. It's, as someone termed it, a slow way to get rich. Now, there's other ways to invest in property, obviously. Yeah. yeah there's um, flipping and there's, there's art and renos and all the rest of it. There's, there's great ways to make money out of property. And that's a whole other conversation. Mm. So the, the conversation that I have with rent investors is, you know, you in order to get to your end goal, whatever that end goal may be, and for most people it's, I want to buy my own home, great. Here's an alternative way of doing it. We can set this up so that you have got positive cash flow pro- properties that are going to help you to buy, hold them for the long term, and you're going to actually then be able to see the benefit without too much hip pocket pain to to hold that for the long term. With people who've already mm-hmm. had their own home, and there's another combination too, which is coming to the fore, which I'll mention in a minute. But for people who are, already have their own home and they think, oh, it's time to buy an investment property, those people kind of, they've done the hard yards. They've, done, they've saved for their deposit and they've gone, wow, okay, now I need to buy. Where will I buy? What will I buy? How will I do it? How does it work? How? Mm. And they should be asking those questions because – Buying an investment property is not about buying anything anywhere and hoping and praying it's going to work for you. There's a lot of groundwork that needs to go in to understand what you want to, what's going to work for you. But most importantly, is setting yourself up first and foremost with a strategy. A lot of people, when I say, oh, do you have a strategy? They say, what's that? Because this is a fairly new idea that in order to reach the end game, we need to have a strategy. My analogy is, for those people is, okay, if you're going to build a house, would you just order in a whole lot of construction equipment and stuff and, and just try and build a house without even having a plan? Yeah. And they go, 
hell no, I wouldn't do that. Well, of course not. And having a, a property investment strategy is the same thing. Where are we headed for? What are we going to achieve in the end? So I have that that conversation with both parties, but even more so with those that are wanting to have already bought and are investing for the first time. And there's even more people nowadays that are actually changing their first property into an investment property and then upscaling into perhaps a bigger home. Maybe their family's grown Mm. and they need something else. So that's another sort of scenario as well that I'm seeing more and more these days. So just on that, I can somewhat empathise for someone that says, look, I don't have a strategy. My idea of a strategy was to buy the property. Now, we know that's an action, not a strategy. Is it because they can't necessarily control the outcome? Therefore, how can I have a strategy. I'll give an example. I can't control the cash flow on that because I don't know if there's going to be a hot water leak or there's going to be maintenance issues. I can't predict. I can't pre- I can't control the capital growth. Therefore, I don't know what that's going to look like in the value's going to look like in two or three years time. So I'm very much subject to market conditions. So my strategy is I would like to build X type of you know uh, rental income to supplement my life in the future or a portfolio that's worth X, but they can't get past this level of I don't control these variables, therefore, I can't. How do I cement a strategy or lock that down? For example, Julie, what's mm. what are your thoughts? So, how so what can you control? That that's the real question. Yeah. What can you control when you're a property investor? You can control your your ingoing costs. So, for example, if you're looking to buy something that is positive cash flow as opposed to being negatively geared, then I think that's a step in the right direction because. At the very least, you've got initially control over that cash flow. What smashed the cash flow for everybody was interest rate rises, <laughs> blew it right out of the ballpark. Yeah. So we, you know, that, but for those people who were really negatively geared at the start, they're in much more pain than mm. those people who actually entered the market with a positive cash flow property. And what else can we control? Well, we can control what we buy. Okay, are there properties out there that will give us an even better return than just a, a house on a block of land, for example? Well, yeah, there are. There are things like dual income properties. So, and please, please, when you hear that word, please don't buy brand new off the plan. Please do not do that. Thank you. Um, Great advice. That's my disclaimer. Yeah. Don't do it. I have, for my clients, looked at, you know, four-year-old, five-year-old dual income properties in Brisbane area that were less than what people paid for them brand new. And Why the- is that, Julie? Because the first question I'll get from someone is, how did that happen when property prices have increased in value over the last four to five years? How is it that this particular property hasn't risen in value? Yeah. Well, I'm talking about four years ago yeah. when we were buying those properties. So, so yes, they did exist. Yeah. But I guess, you know, I know it's going to sound like a size pitch, but it's not meant to be. Mm. If you're using someone who's in the market all day, every day, whose eyes are looking for these properties, mm. you understand a better chance of actually being able to source them. Sourcing them yourself is a bit tricky. Yeah. So buyers agents are there doing that all the time. And I guess, you know, what else can we buy? Well, we can buy properties that have a small subdivision potential. Yeah, nice. You know, so so we don't have to buy the vanilla house on land and stick a tenant in and hope for the best for the next 20 years. We can actually control some of these factors by having the strategy of looking for properties that are going to get, get us further faster. Yeah, nice. So there's a couple of examples there. Oh, beautiful. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. There's another niche that you, you serve and I, I guess it's, they have different needs, they have different requirements, for example, and that's the female investor. Um, oh. Like you mentioned before, that you got to a certain point in life where you're like, hey, my superannuation isn't going to serve me well into my long-term retirement, therefore I need to take some action now. For example, we've got younger females and we look at some of our younger female clients out of uni, highly qualified, for example, good incomes, want to stand on their own two feet, therefore they've got the means and the borrowing capacity and the ability to get into the market themselves. Excellent. So why is it that females maybe need a different a different energy or a specialist in their corner as well, Julie? Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. And I, I've dealt with a lot of women over the last 13 years that I've had this business. And a lot of women, they need every single box ticked before they'll put their hand up and say, yes, I'm ready to, to do that investing thing now. That's one thing. We t- Women t- do very much invest differently to men. Men men probably take more what we would perceive as risk, you know, mm-hmm. what if it if it sort of works and it's kind of looks good and yeah, look, I'll go with that and mm-hmm. that's okay. And, you know, 
if it works, it works, it works, it works. It's good. But for women, yeah, we just need a lot more. I hate using the word hand holding. It's guidance. They need need more guidance yeah. in that that process to be able to come to a really good conclusion for themselves as to what it is that, you know, they want to do. One of the worst things I see happening at the moment is, well, worst as in heartbreaking, is that there's a lot of women who, yes, they might be on good income and they might be good at saving. They get a little bit lost in then the process and a lot of people just can't believe that they can't invest, that they don't have the capacity to invest. They use every excuse like, I'm too young, I'm too old, um, I'm not sure how it works. I, it's going to cost me too much money. It's going to wreck my lifestyle. I don't know. I'm not really sure what I should do with it. Should I just buy shares or should I just, you know, what should I do? Mm. And so there's a lot of people in that boat who are, are just not asking the right question. And the right question is, I'm earning a great income. I don't have any other commitments as such. How can I start to build my wealth? Because what I want is for your 70-year-old self to look back at your life and say, thank goodness Mm. you had that conversation 40 years ago when you could have done something and you did something. You made a start. It was a small start. You made a smart start, but you got there. And now look at what you've, now you can live the life that you want on your terms. One of the most disturbing things that's come out I think recently with this shift in both interest rate rises and also with um, the cost of living and inflation is that, you know, guess what? People now, when we retire, we don't need, you know, 600,000 for a nice, easy retirement, good, comfortable retirement. We need 800,000 because, and, and this is where you know, the ground keeps shifting because as inflation rises and if we, if we like, to think that we're going to live to sort of 70, 80, 90, maybe 100. Maybe. I mean, what are they saying, Julie, that if you're 50 yeah. by the time it's 2030 that you'll live to 100 is what is what I've heard recently. I'm like, that's an insane number when you think yeah. about that. But, yeah, keep going. Yep, and it is an insane number. Yeah. And if you aspire to retire at the, the retirement age of 67, that's how many? 30? Two-thirds of your life, yeah. Third of your life that you actually have to fund. Yeah. So... You know, it's not about, and then this one gets me, cashing up money, cashing up a good investment and sticking it in the bank and getting bank interest on it. Where do we get that from? There's the, yeah. I think what, what needs to happen is for women in particular, if you're not sure, reach out, mm. find your how. How can I do this to make my 70-year-old self proud of what I did and built my assets myself and, and lived a great time and that's what I'd love, love to hear. <laughs> oh, thanks very much. Mm-hmm. And then kind of shifting gears a little bit, I know that, you know, you, like you mentioned, you've been in business quite some time as a buyer's agent and probably seen the buyer's agency industry change, develop, now start to come into a little bit more, I won't say maturity, but it's infancy and kind of coming out of that stage as well, right? So, And I know that you're kind of taking a bit more of a leadership role within the buyer's agency industry to go, look, how do we, and I think it's where brokers have been, is that how do we raise the standard? How do we kind of clean it up so there's you know, less cowboys? How do we make sure it's self-regulated? The Pippa do a great example of that, for example, as well. So how have you then started to go into that more mentor leader level inside the buyer's agency world? And then off the back of that, how do you think a client gets the best engagement out of their buyer's agent too? Fantastic question. <clears throat> yes, when I started this business in 2010, I used to say to people, you know, I'd say, oh, I'm a buyer's agent and they'd say, what's that? And I'd say, <laughs> well, I'm a licensed real estate agent, but I'm not like them. I don't do work like those guys. I actually help people to buy an investment property and build like, a What? Portfolio. Someone pays you to buy our place? <laughs> yeah. And and. You know, Julie, there's plenty of places for sale on realestate.com.au. I just get on there and I just buy it. Like, yeah, okay. Well, let me know how that works for you. Um, And I hope it works well. But, you know, if you want to make sure then... Anyway, yeah. so so that's sort of how how that has changed. And like the finance industry, there's a lot of new people that are coming into the, the buyer's agent world. Yeah. And, and I think it's a great thing. I love the idea of an industry right before our eyes growing and, and you know, for the most part, being able to provide people with such a great service. You mm. know, it, it, it warms my heart. However, there are a lot of people that 
again, need guidance. And being a buyer's agent, unless you've got a, a big agency with, you know, a lot of people under you, it's quite a lonely existence. Yeah. We'll and see. you don't, you know, the mindset of being, I'm, I'm putting on my business hat now. Yeah. The mindset of being in business is such that it can really spin you out when things slow down, speed up. You know, business is, is an ever-changing animal. And so therefore, yeah, if you're a buyer's agent out there on your own, it can be pretty daunting. So, so yeah, I, I thought, why not package up my knowledge over the last, well, 21 years of investing, but, you know, the last 13 years of running a buyer's agency and helping people to really understand the nuances of running business as a buyer's agent and helping people to get the very best outcome that they possibly can. And that starts with their strategy. So, and giving back to the industry that I really love, I think, you know, there's, it's been such a, the real estate industry has been so good to me and I know that, you know, there are great buyers agents out there who just need to be coached. So that's what yeah. I've put my hand up to do. I'm a buyers agent coach and helping others in the industry. Oh, yeah. Well done. It's excellent. I think that's what we want, like uh, iron sharpening iron, right? Like the lessons that you've learned, the thousands of properties you've bought, thousands of conversations you have with clients. So kind of bottling that up and go, well, how do you avoid making these fatal errors, especially in business or client relationships? And then how do you navigate the business side which i'm sure in any type of 100 percent commissions type environment role that it is there's naturally some turnover there's naturally some attrition there's people that maybe have engaged a buyer's agent didn't get a great experience and that does a disservice to the industry as opposed to the intention was to raise the bar and help serve more australians we well, want to make sure that, that gets preserved and honored as well so well done good luck with that Thank Beautiful. You. Julie, I want to say thank you very much. I know we get, you and I could talk and that's why we've got you back on and I'm going to get you back on in the future again. So kind of watch this space. If you do want to keep an eye out, Australian Property Investment Solutions is the name of Julie's company. Like you said, you've got a great reputation. You've been around a long time. Those results speak for themselves. So I want to say thank you very much for your time and your knowledge, being generous as always, and we'll see you around the traps. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Aaron, uh, very much. Thank you, Julie. I really appreciate it. And if that's been helpful to you, we'd love to get a review if you found that helpful or better yet, reach out with some questions and some thoughts that you'd like answered in the future. That's a wrap for another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. Thanks very much.